I had always been good at hiding. In a crowd, a corner, or even just against the walls, I was always difficult to find. It caused my parents all kinds of trouble. When I was a baby and my cries filled the house, they ran from room to room, unable to find me. When I didn't cry, it was even worse. The first few years of my life were awful for them. They spent half the time thinking they must be terrible parents. And they were boring for me, because I had to wait so long to be fed. When I grew a little older I understood my power better. On the first day of nursery I sat in the corner drawing ladybirds on my own. Not a single other child spoke to me. I liked it that way, and I continued through school, hiding in the corner. That was, until Mike moved into the house at the end of the street. It was a tall, mysterious building and he was a tall, mysterious boy. And he went to the same school as me. To the teachers, Mike was a good student, to his friends, he was a good laugh, and I guess to his parents he was a good son. To me, he was everything. Despite this, I couldn't change my habits. I was too used to being the weird kid, sat alone in the corner. At break time, I used to climb inside an oak tree in the playground, which the other kids never noticed. I would stare at Mike from the tree, studying him like an insect under a magnifying glass. Not all was good, though. It was around then that the bad times started. During biology class, Mr. Blair mentioned the old oak tree in the playground, and the magic spell was broken. Suddenly, the other kids could see the tree which they couldn't see before. The tree I sat in every break time. And the next day, the mean kids came to see me. Darren was the biggest kid in our year, and the meanest. He came to my tree with his friends, and then the bad times followed. Those months were hell for me, and I don't like to think back on them, even now. I spent night after night wishing for bad things to happen to Darren. I wished that his eyes would rot and fall out in his sleep, that his nails would come off, that his skin would dry up and break into a thousand pieces, like sweets smashed on the concrete. Then one day, he didn't show up to school. There was nobody I could ask what happened to him but eventually I heard that he had some kind of skin disease. He had dried up like an old bean and gone to hospital, and it didn't look like he would get better. The others left me alone after that. I don't know why. Maybe they thought I had something to do with Darren's problem. I also wondered if I had something to do with it. Could you wish pain upon someone so much that bad things really happened to them? A few weeks later, Mike came to visit me in my tree. Hey! I was sat inside, reading a book about bugs while hundreds of bugs climbed over me. I didn't know what to say, so I ignored him and kept reading my book. Hey! He repeated. I looked up. But I didn't dare look at him. It was your birthday last week. Our class leader, Ms. Mezel, announced class birthdays at the beginning of each week. Luckily, mine had come at the same time as several others. Nobody noticed the name of a boy who they didn't even know was in the class. Except for Mike. Mmrmich, I said, sounding like a dying cat. I got you a present. Oh? My heart beat fast. It's special, though. 
You'll need to come collect it. Ang. It seemed I could only communicate in animal noises now. Come over to mine at 5 p.m. tonight. He knocked his hand against the tree and walked away. I held my book tightly. I thought through what had just happened. Mike had got me a birthday present. He knew I existed. I was going to his house. The happiness disappeared and was replaced by ice-cold fear. What was I going to wear? How was I going to act? What was I going to say? The feeling followed me around all afternoon. It was as if someone had poured a bucket of ice over me and left me dripping wet. That afternoon, a horrible autumn wind blew, and huge drops of rain fell from the sky. When I knocked on his front door at five, I was freezing cold. His mother, a tall and unmysterious woman, opened the door. You must be Cecil. Come in. Gosh, you look freezing. Here, it's nice and warm in the living room. I followed her through a tall corridor into a tall room, where Mike was standing in front of some kind of box. It was covered with a blanket that had a stars and moon pattern. He was playing with his watch, and he jumped a little as I came in. Happy birthday, Cecil. He pulled back the blanket, and underneath there was a plastic cage with some sticks in it. I wanted to stay by the door, but I wanted to see what was in the cage more. I walked over to look, and saw something small and black crawling around among the sticks. A stag beetle. Oh, stag beetles are my favorite. Mike's face shone like a birthday cake. Really? I'm so glad. Oh, I was worried that, well, maybe you hate bugs. I laughed. The idea was silly. I loved all insects. I opened the cage and picked up the stag beetle. He had a very shiny shell, and a big horn. I'm going to call you Little Mike, I said to the beetle, loud enough that Mike could hear. I carefully put him back in the box and closed it, and then I did the bravest thing I've ever done. I hugged Mike. Thank you. It's perfect. It's nothing. You have to tell me when your birthday is. February the 13th. I repeated the date to myself so that I would remember it. What I didn't know was that that date would end up being very, very important. Little Mike was my first ever pet. My parents had always said I was too careless for one, but I looked after my stag beetle like he was the most important thing in the world. Once a week, Big Mike came round to visit Little Mike. I think he's growing bigger, he would say. Soon he'll be as big as you. But I'm just small. Exactly. At school, Mike was in a different class to me, and at break time he hung out with his own friends. I didn't mind. We walked home together after school, and I never knew what to say, so I usually ended up talking about little Mike. Christmas came and went. Mike ended up going to visit his grandparents in Edinburgh, so I didn't see him for a few weeks. Those weeks were awful. I made him a photo album with pictures of little Mike, so that on Christmas Day he could feel close to me. He gave me a tiny little woolen scarf that he had knitted, for little Mike, and an adult-sized scarf for me. 
I wrapped myself up in it and smelled it and pretended it was him. But after Christmas, something was different with Mike. One day, on the way home from school, he turned to me and said, "Have you ever looked at a girl?" Well, duh, I see girls every day. No, I mean looked at one. Like you can't take your eyes off her. I thought about it for a moment. The only person I'd looked at like that was Mike. Big Mike, of course. You're going red. You have. Have not. My face is just warm. It's winter. Shut up. We were at the corner of the road we lived on, so I ran home and didn't look back. That night I couldn't sleep. I was thinking through all the girls in school, trying to decide which one Mike was looking at. The worst thing was, I didn't know why I cared so much. I didn't care about his other friends, so why did I care that he might have a girlfriend? The next day at school, I sat inside my tree, but instead of reading, I watched. I watched him go up to a girl with long brown hair and give her a flower. I didn't even know her name. I walked home alone that day, quickly so that Mike wouldn't see me. I spent all weekend feeling sick and thinking bad things about her. I wished all her hair would fall out. On Monday, something was happening in the playground. The girl, Mike's girl, was stood in a circle of kids. She was wearing a big woolen hat, and she had pulled it down right over her ears. The kids were teasing her. One tried to take her hat. She pushed him away, tears in her eyes. Then Darren, who was behind her, pulled it right off her head. As soon as her head was revealed, the kids all started laughing. It was as smooth and shiny as little Mike's shell. Not a hair was left on it. I had done it again. At lunch, I hid in my tree and thought about what I'd done. Then there was a knock from outside that made me jump and hit my head. It's me. What do you want? How is little Mike doing? He said, ignoring my anger. He's fine. He started to learn how to draw. This was only half true. I had given him a pen and he had drawn a few lines, but it wasn't really art. Oh, that's great. Listen, I have to tell you something. What? About your girlfriend? Suddenly, I was glad I'd made her bald. No, it's. Can you please look at me? I turned to face him. He looked very worried. She's not my girlfriend, he said quietly. Then why did you give her a flower? I. Look, that's not important now. I came to tell you that I'm leaving. What? On February the thirteenth, we're moving back to Scotland. But that's your birthday. It was a stupid thing to say, but I couldn't help it. It was the day before Valentine's Day, and I had been thinking of all kinds of things to give him. I was going to get him the best birthday Valentine's present ever. I know it's my birthday. We'll have to celebrate some other time. Why are you moving? We just have to. I'm sorry, I can't explain it. Scotland is so far away. It's not that far. We can write. But from the way his voice drooped, I could tell that wasn't going to happen. Ever since Christmas, we had been moving apart, 
and this was going to be the end of us. On February the 13th I didn't even say goodbye. I picked up little Mike's box and took it up to the attic, and closed all the curtains so that I was in the dark. I heard the doorbell, and my parents opening the door. It was Big Mike. My parents called and called, ran through the house to look for me, but they couldn't find me. Nobody could ever find me. Then I heard the front door close, and a few minutes later, the sound of their car going down the road and disappearing into the distance. I took Mike Jr. out of his box and held him. You're all I have now. Little Mike died this morning. Sorry, let me give you the full story. I'm an entomologist now. Of course, nobody knows what that means. Half the people I meet think I'm some kind of doctor. So I explain by saying, I'm a bug scientist. After Mike left, I replaced him with bug books. I spent all my teenage years either reading about bugs or handling them. In my bedroom I had a beetle breeding house, an ant farm, and a huge box of stick insects. I tried to convince my parents to get a box of bees in the garden, but they said that was too much. I bred bugs, I handled bugs, I dreamt of bugs. Of course, a few years after Mike left I realized I was gay. It had been completely obvious to all those around me, but I ended up being the last to know. In some ways, I was glad Mike had left. He clearly saw me as just a friend. After school, I went to the University of Reading to study entomology, that's bug studies. My parents wanted me to choose a more normal subject, and specialize in entomology. The thing is, I had no interest in other types of biology. Insects were the only thing I cared about. I finished my undergraduate degree and went straight into a PhD, and I'm currently doing a postdoctorate in reading. It's a nice place. My parents are always saying, Cecil, you need to get out more. They tell me I'm a young, attractive guy, that there are plenty of men out there who would love me, even with my bugs. The thing is, I'm sure they're not wrong. I'm not the shy, strange kid I used to be. I have friends now, although most of them are bug nerds like me. But I'm just not interested in a relationship. It's too much work, and if he's not interested in bugs, what's the point? Besides, whenever I do go to a bar, nobody notices me. On the weekends, I usually take the train to London Zoo. I volunteer and take groups of school kids round the bug houses. Sometimes there are kids who hate bugs, or are afraid of them, but I have a secret trick to change their minds. I bring along little Mike in his box and introduce them to him, and all of their fear and lack of interest goes away. Wait, that's not right. I used to bring along Little Mike. Not anymore. Little Mike has lived for an extraordinarily long time. The average time a stag beetle lives is between three and seven years. Little Mike lived for fifteen years. And of all the days to die, he did it this morning, the 13th of February. The day Big Mike left. I've been crying a lot. All my emotions from that time, which I hid inside of me, are coming up now like a fountain. For the first time in years, I wonder what Mike is up to. What did he study at university? Did he even go to university? How are his parents? 
A thought strikes me, what if he's married, to a woman? I try to tell myself I would be happy for him, but I can't lie to myself anymore. Pull yourself together, I say to myself. I go and make some tea, and think about my ant farm. I have an idea of how I'm going to change all the paths. But then I start thinking about what Mike would say, no, that shape is all wrong. You should do it like this, see? Then the ants will be happy, and it'll look nice. What do you know about ants? I say, and then I realize I'm talking to myself. It's a bad habit of mine. I pour my cup of tea and sit down to check my emails. Academic emails are always boring, and I need something boring to take my mind off Little Mike and Big Mike. I look through the lists of junk, announcements, and questions from students. And then I see it. From Michael Walker. Subject, Hi, Bug Boy. I delete the email and go for my tea. I drink a big mouthful and burn my mouth. I'm shaking. Now, after all these years. But I have to know. I put the mug down, move the mouse to my rubbish bin, and open the email. My heart beating hard, I open it. I read it quickly. Then I hit reply. A few days later, and we've agreed to meet for coffee. He lives in London, so reading isn't far from him. I'm standing outside the cafe, hiding in the door from the late winter rain. Part of me is saying I need to get out of there, that he's just going to hurt me again. But the rest of me knows that if I don't see him now, I'll be thinking about him for the rest of my life. Hey! I almost don't recognize him at first. He has a short haircut, in a fashionable style, and a neat, stylish beard. He smiles, and then I know it's him. Hi, Big Mike. He laughs. It's been a long time since I heard that name. We go inside and order drinks, and I go straight to what I've been thinking about. So why did you leave? Really? For a long time he says nothing, and stares into his coffee. Then he looks me in the eye and says, Do you believe in magic? I laugh. Have you become a witch or something? One of those Wiccans. He shakes his head. No, not like that. But think about it. Haven't you ever noticed that you were particularly hard to notice? I'm good at hiding in the corner. It's more than that. You make the corner disappear. You know I've been trying to get in touch with you for three years. I choke on my hot chocolate. Why? He makes a face at me. You should know why. Anyway, I'm amazed I even found you. You might not call it magic, but there's something around you, something that prevents others from seeing you. I think on his words. They make sense, on some level. And then I remember something. Something I'd forgotten for a long time. There was this one thing, in school. Someone was bullying me, and then he went into hospital. And there was that girl. Beth? The one that went bald? I smile nervously. He remembers her name. Yeah, her. You keep in touch? We do. He smiles. She decided to stay with the bald look, 
and she looks really cool now. But anyway, I don't think those things happened because of you. Of course they didn't, because magic isn't real. I did them. I stare at him. Sorry. Your thing is stopping people from noticing you. Mine is, well, when I really care about someone, whatever they want ends up happening. Without me trying. I shake my head. How long have you been thinking about all this? Think about it. That bully got ill when I noticed he was bullying you, in your little tree. And that girl lost all her hair when I noticed you staring at her. You wanted bad things to happen to them, but I caused them to happen. Neither of us caused it. It was just chance. It's easy for you to say all this now, because it's in the past. I've had lots of experiences like these, though. I might look healthy now, but a few years ago, I was in hospital. Oh my god, what for? A stomach problem. It was one of the worst things they had ever seen, the doctors told me. The week before, my boyfriend and I had a huge fight. And he said he hoped I rotted from the inside out. Like an apple that went bad. Well, that started to happen. My stomach basically started dying. But as soon as I apologized to him, I got better. We're not together anymore, by the way. I'm shaking. I hold the warm mug tighter in my hands. That's why I moved away. I was worried about what might happen. What if you wished me dead? What if you wished yourself dead? I tried to hide my emotions, to not care about anyone. It didn't work. Then why now? Why even get in touch with me again? He smiles, and my heart melts all over again. Because I care about you. Too much to ignore it. After that time where I almost died, I realized that there's always going to be a chance of my power doing something bad. I just have to take that chance. Anyway, you clearly wanted to see me, too. How do you know that? Simple. If you didn't wish to see me, my magic wouldn't work, and I wouldn't have been able to find you. I think about it for a moment. It is strange. His email arrived just after I started thinking about him. Wishing to see him again. Fine, then. I'll accept this, magic thing, for now, though it still sounds a bit silly. Now, tell me what you've been up to. Well, you know how I knitted you that scarf? I remember. I run a clothes business, now. In fact. He pulls out a scarf from his bag. It's green, with a little black pattern on it. I look closer, and realize that the pattern is of little stag beetles. It's our most popular product. Oh, it's beautiful. That reminds me. Little Mike died. He looks sad. He reaches out and takes my hand, and looks me in the eye. Then it's a good thing you have Big Mike back again, huh? After we finish our coffee, he comes round to my house and I show him all my insects. That evening, he stays the night. And the night after that, and the night after that. I may have lost the beetle, but I kept the boy.